Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last March, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person at 6300 A Street or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of the faith that we share. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place for it. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In this time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? In our 150th year as a congregation, who are we and what are we doing? This is, as Res Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. She also says this is no time to go it alone. And this, right now, right here, is where we practice that. So take a moment as we begin the service this morning. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here this morning. Set aside what will come later. Be right here. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. Our chalice lighting today comes from Joy Harjo, Poet Laureate. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, and animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember, the dance language is, that life is. Remember. Our minister reminds us from time to time that what makes a church a church is its life as a story maker over decades unto centuries. A church is a continuous story making community that binds together its generations and then transcends them. Our church as a legal corporation or as a property holder can be said to have come into being 150 years ago this year in 1870. By three years thereafter, however, it's small chapel at 12th and 8th streets had actually become a rental hall. It was peopled by worshiping universalists only sporadically when an occasional preacher could be lured to town as a guest. Over the next 10 years, in the midst of nationwide financial panic and region-wide locust infestations, the Universalist Society's supporters were reduced to a handful of squabblers who together could do little more than muster a plaintive cry for help and send it to the Universalist General Convention. The arrival of that cry 
into the ears of two persons there. A young couple just planning marriage marks the real beginning of our life as a church, in my view, and I want to introduce them to you. I introduce to you first Kate Matthews. Here's how that cry reached her eyes and ears. In February 1883, I was teaching school in Meriden, Connecticut, my hometown, and Mr. Chapman was pastor of the Grove Hall Church in one of the most delightful suburbs of Boston, having been called to the place before he graduated from Tufts University Theological School. I was looking forward to life in that interesting city and among most congenial people. On arriving home one afternoon, I found a letter from Mr. C stating that the General Convention had written to him to know if he would go out to Lincoln, Nebraska, as the church there had appealed for help. It would be hard work, uncertain and small salary. What did I think about starting out March 1st? You can fancy that I didn't have much appetite for supper. I cried all night, but with the morning I rose with a clear vision. I wrote that he must follow the dictates of his conscience, and wherever that led, I would follow and do my share, but we would not be married at once. He would have to come back after me if he went in March. He agreed to my plan and preached his sermon in Lincoln, March 12th, I think, 1883. So now I introduce you to Evan Chapin, Kate's Mr. C. To the Universalist Conference, he was a Western man. His undergraduate studies had been taken at Lombard College in Galesburg, Illinois, before he went to Tufts. And that was why they thought he might come to Lincoln, which others had declined. On March 11, 1883, the day before that first sermon here, the Nebraska State Journal published his purpose in answering the cry for help. We purpose to organize every department of our work at the earliest moment, and to do all that we can in the direction of a broad, earnest, constructive religious movement. We do not desire to do a merely critical, negative, and destructive work. We cordially invite and urge the cooperation of all liberal Christians of whatever name and who sympathize with us in our views and purposes and who can cooperate with us heartily in the advancement of these. We think it possible to make liberal and rational Christianity a permanent and assured success, a growing and beneficent power in our midst. Evan's first challenge, however, was to invite and urge cooperation of the members of his own small congregation. That first week, he interviewed people whose names he found on the list of former members, the outs, they were called. He reported his talks to the current church leaders, and he was told that they did not get him out here to make friends with those people, but to get them out, root and branch. He replied that if he stayed, he should endeavor to unite all the discordant elements. The next morning, the leaders told him he could stay if he cared to do so, but that his course of action would only result in the loss of a liberal church in the city. He ministered solo through the spring and the summer. His church consisted of parts of just five or six families. In October, then, he went east to attend the Universalist Convention and to marry Kate Matthews. Together, they boarded the train heading west, reaching Lincoln just before Thanksgiving. Here's what Kate found and what she started to do. I found the Sunday school consisted of Mr. C's class of two young women and two young men. I started a second class with Fred Sexton as sole member. It grew to 14 boys in a year's time. We organized our class and called it the Builders. Miss Preen organized the girls of the same age, the Lend a Hand Club. There was a spirited rivalry between the two. At the end of the year, if we had a congregation of 25, we were so elated we smiled all the rest of the week. Now the windows through which we can view the next 13 years are small and scattered, but oh so tantalizing. Marianne Meisner, our member now, has found that her great-great-great-aunt, Lorena George Fowler, actually drowned in the year 1886 here in Lincoln, when her runaway horse with buggy went into Salt Creek. 
On March the 1st of that year, it's recorded, her funeral service was held in the Universalist Church. For Lorena was a member of the International Order of Grand Templars, a temperance organization, and Evan Chapin was a temperance leader. In other fireside chats, you've heard the story of Mary Manell's central role in first gathering the church and erecting its first chapel. Well, just two weeks after Lorena Fowler's funeral, the Nebraska State Journal gave notice of Ms. Manell's death in San Francisco. And later, the paper recorded the sermon that Evan gave at the fifth anniversary of his arrival in Lincoln. Whatever this church might be in the future, it will be that in no small degree, because Mary Monell was so faithful to the cause she loved in her day and generation. It is not usual for the Universalist Church to canonize its dead, but I cannot think of this woman without feeling that she was our patron saint. We are now united and prepared for Christian work. We need more thorough organization. We need more labor to make the church a permanent institution. Universalism has noble ideas and sentiments, but to benefit from them ourselves and to benefit the world with them, they must be put into tangible form. Their instrument is the church. Through it, through your loyalty, may we, may we rise up higher into the divine life. Kate gives us another snapshot of the church's worship life. We had the best quartet choir in the city with Mr. and Mrs. Woolley, tenor and soprano, Miss Beardsley, contralto, and Mr. C, bass. I was organist and had charge of the music. Later on, Mr. Hillman sang bass and Mr. McCarger, tenor. The latter always brought two small black and tan dogs who kept out of sight until the closing hymn, when they mounted the rostrum and faced the audience with Mr. C. And the church's historians have faithfully celebrated Evans' record of community ministry. He was school board member for six years. He was co-founder of the Charity Organization Society. In 1910, the State Journal recalled that when the city administration fell into bad hands, the Reverend Chapin shamed a good many people into taking an interest in public affairs. When the gambling houses were reopened, he visited them personally in search of evidence to close them back up again. Perhaps most memorable for many was Evans' work to organize Lincoln's first ministerial union and then to find himself voted out of its ranks when its members adopted an evangelical basis for membership. Three other clergy, the rector of the Trinity Episcopal Church, the pastor of First Congregational Church, and the pastor of First Christian Church all resigned their memberships to protest Evans' ouster. In fact, in Kate's recollection, public sympathy on that account enabled Evan to galvanize the congregation to raise the original chapel at 12th and H and to replace it with a large, imposing red sandstone structure. That building was dedicated in 1893. From this great height, though, in just three more short years, the debt that was taken to build that new church and the nation's financial reversals and the church's continued dependence on the General Association assistance all worked to end the Chapin's time in Lincoln. With Kate back east visiting family in the spring of 1896, Evan wrote to her, I shall have no trouble at all in leaving Nebraska when the time comes to go if the parish pays us $15 a week and we receive the appropriation of $500 from the general convention, we stay. If either fails to do this, we go. And you may rest assured that there will be no compromise on my part. And Kate later recorded, The general convention failed to rise to the occasion, and we left Lincoln in July 1896. The measure of any ministry, though I believe, is the vitality of the church after the minister's departure. In another fireside chat, you have learned of church board secretary Ira Hatfield's work following the Chapin's departure to hold the church together as it sought out some way to pay the debt incurred in building that new building and to re-employ the minister. In 1901, Hatfield wrote to Evan, for two years, the people of the Lincoln Parish have maintained complete church services without a pastor, 
holding preaching services every Sunday, usually with some member of the church in the pulpit. A young people's meeting was held every Sunday evening, keeping up a good and efficient Sunday school and conducting the social and helpful organizations like the Ladies Aid Society. At the end of that time, the members determined that their best future was attainable by disbanding as a Universalist Church and reincorporating as a Unitarian Church. And practically every one of those connected with the Universalist Church afterwards became identified with All Souls Unitarian. Ninety-seven people signed on as charter members. At their departure from Lincoln, Evan returned to the Illinois campus of Lombard College to serve as professor of applied theology at their divinity school for three years. And then the family moved again, now to serve the Universalist Church in Rockland, Maine. But ten years later, in 1909, Evan Chapin died. He was just 53. Kate survived Evan by almost 40 years. She saw their three children, Charles, Elsa, and Neely, go to be respectively a successful businessman, a professor of English in New York, and a naval admiral. She lived first in Santa Barbara, California, and then in New York, New York, and finally in Montpelier, Vermont, where she died in 1948 at the age of 87. Ten years following their departure, the church held a service commemorating the Chapin's work here together, and several speakers celebrated their joint contributions to Lincoln's music, to its social welfare, and, of course, to our church. And at the service's conclusion, these sepia portraits of each of them in large form were presented for display in the church. So thank you, Kate, and thank you, Evan for our trip. Our story today is called The Almond Tree by Faye Morganson. Talia's face was like a complicated map full of ridges and wrinkles. Her back was bent over, and when she walked, she shuffled. But still, she had a twinkle in her eye, and she always had a kind word for her neighbors, her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. She spent most of her days in her rocking chair, looking out over her garden, if she had a visitor, she'd share memories of the good old days, and when she was alone, she'd remember to herself. Now and then, she'd hum a little or wiggle her fingers. It was during one of those mornings alone that Talia surprised herself by coming up with an ambitious decision. She made a phone call. A few hours later, when the doorbell rang, the delivery man was patient while she slowly shuffled her way to the door. She directed him to carry the very tall, skinny parcel he had brought to a bare corner of the garden. He kindly helped her find the garden spade and pull a lawn chair over, and then she paid him and waved him off. Slowly, very slowly, she dug a big hole in the ground. It was hard work. Now and then she'd sit on the lawn chair to take a break, but she got back up several times until eventually the hole was just the right size. 
She unwrapped the bottom of the tall, skinny parcel and took it out of its container and then slowly, very slowly, she shuffled and rotated it into the hole. Ker plunk. She sat back down to inspect it and was satisfied. Slowly, very slowly, she began to push the dirt back into the hole all around the bottom of the parcel. <sighs> that too was hard work. Over and again, when she got tired, she sat down on the lawn chair to take a break, and then she got back up, and finally she was finished. She unwrapped that tall, skinny parcel, and there it was. You probably guessed. A beautiful sapling tree. She sat down once again to admire it. And about then, her neighbor arrived home and poked her head over the fence. She looked alarmed and said, Talia, you be careful. What are you doing? Planting a tree? Ridiculous. Someone your age? Is it an almond tree? It won't produce almonds for years. Talia laughed as she pointed to a very old tree in the opposite corner of her garden. Some of its branches were broken right off and others were bent with age, and most of them were bare even though it was the middle of spring. She said, I'm like that old almond tree. My great-grandmother planted it. I loved to climb it when I was a little girl. Its branches were broad and strong, and I felt safe there. Then, when I was a young woman, I picked some of its delicate pink blossoms and decorated my hair with them. I think that's how my husband came to notice me. The neighbor began to smile, and as usual, there was no stopping Talia or her story. When I was a mother, I picked the almonds, roasted them to perfection, and served them to my family. When I was a grandmother, I rested in the shade of the almond tree, and now I'm a great-grandmother. Talia was looking very dreamy as she continued. I have lots of time on my hands. I sit and remember as I look out my window, mostly I'm happy with my life, but a little while ago as I was looking out into my garden, I realized that I had never planted a tree, never, and it just didn't seem right. I have great-grandchildren. Great-grandchildren, said the neighbor. Talia exclaimed, yep, and they need an almond tree. Of course, laughed the neighbor as she pledged herself to do something for her great-grandchildren too, even though she didn't yet have any. I wonder what that will be. Perhaps she will plant a tree. What do you think? And as for Talia, after planting the tree, she returned to her rocking chair to look out her window, and she smiled. What is it that you are going to leave for the next generation? That is the end of our story. Thank you. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln is beginning our pledge drive. As you think about your giving to the church, please keep in mind this. Not only are you pledging for this year and all that we are needing to sustain our community in this unique time, but also how our messages, our values, all we do with Sunday school and education prepare our church community and our children in this community for the future of Unitarian Universalism. What fruits of our labor now will our children see in years to come? Hi, I'm Teresa Forsman, our church's treasurer. I don't think we had any doubt how much we loved our building and our congregation. And for seven months now, not being able to gather in our building, not being able to connect in our preferred way, to feel the physical presence of one another, to sit side by side and lift our voices together, has only made our hearts grow fonder for our building and for one another. At the same time, these last seven months have given us an opportunity to understand something that maybe before was mostly abstract, and that's that we, collectively, are the church. And together, we have kept our church strong during this most unusual year. Oscar is preaching, our musicians are playing, we are tuning in, our building is being maintained inside and out, religious education continues, and most committees are moving forward with their goals, and our program council and our board of trustees have barely missed a, meet, a beat as they temporarily rely on Zoom to come together. Through it all, 
our values, our church's history of doing what needs to be done, has been our North Star. We started this year in a position of strength. We had recently paid off our member loans, the ones used to expand our building, and at the same time, the membership embraced our goals for 2020 and stepped up mightily to support those goals financially. The financial impact of the pandemic has been spread unevenly among our members. Some members have had no choice but to step back from their pledge. Others of us, we trust, will be able to step forward for those who had to step back so that together we continue to keep our church strong, so that together we people of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands will look back on this pandemic period as a challenge that we weathered by adhering to our values. And now our pledge chair, Dorothy Ramsey, will tell you about our church's plans for 2021. Our theme for the pledge drive this year is let's stay strong. This year has been a mixed bag for us. Some things have stayed the same, but some things have become very, very different. As Teresa said, we've been incredibly strong in a really challenging time. Being out of the building is hard, but despite that, our programming not only continues, sometimes in ways we never could have imagined in February, it has grown. Next year, the challenge will be to stay strong. We have daily video updates from Oscar, which likely will continue now and when the current challenge has faded. We also have UU Connect, which likely will continue now and when the current challenge has faded. There are things that have had to be suspended and others that have been continued in altered ways. Coffee hour, morning worship, third Thursday is now every Thursday. We haven't, what hasn't changed are our dreams for the future. They've had to be slightly punted forward, but your board has confirmed that the three goals identified in a previous planning retreat are still areas they want to focus on for 2021. Number one, enhance our technology resources to better serve the congregation and to keep us connected. Number two, continue our racial justice initiatives among our congregation and in the larger Lincoln community through education and training. Number three, make robust plans for the time best to return to the building and to maintain our programs. We know from the recent survey that there are those who may have to step back from their pledge level temporarily. Thankfully, many of you indicated you're, you expect to be able to maintain your current pledge level for the next fiscal church year. We are being incredibly careful with our spending as we pursue our goals and hope to be able to budget for the same level in 2021 as we did in 2020. In order for us to stay strong, we need for those of you who are able to do a bit extra to help keep our overall budget at the level that they are this year. Over the next three weeks, you'll be hearing from other members who will tell you why they intend to help our church stay strong, ending with a status report from me on October 25th. In closing, I want to thank you all for that you do for the church and encourage us all with our pledge theme, let's stay strong. We live in complicated times. Since March, we've been gathering online for worship, either on Zoom or YouTube. And behind the scenes of these worship services, we record relatively early in the week, 
usually on Wednesday or Thursday, editing them on Friday and broadcasting worship on Sunday morning. There's a quote, sometimes attributed to Karl Barth, sometimes Theodore Parker, that we should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And while the saying is apocryphal, its meaning is straightforward. Faith must engage with public life and respond to the needs of the moment. The world is moving fast right now. I recorded this sermon originally on Wednesday afternoon. And in it, I talked about pledging, about how you can tell what a person values by where they give of their time, their talents, and their treasure. And then, for a fair amount of time, and with what I thought was an appropriate amount of levity, I talked about Donald Trump's tax returns. Now, to be clear, I believe that to be fair game for a sermon, and I'm happy to talk at length another day about why. But in the time since I recorded this sermon for the first time, Donald Trump, Melania Trump, three senators, three members of the White House press corps, and several White House staffers have tested positive for COVID-19. It's currently 6.32 on Saturday night. The president is hospitalized at Walter Reed Medical Center, and the situation is evolving quickly. I am no great fan of Donald Trump's. I think that many of the policies that come out of his administration are antithetical to my faith. And as a pastor and a patriot, I am concerned by the chaos and authoritarian tendencies we've seen in the last months and years. But not as a voter, but just as a human being. I join with many around the country and world in praying for the medical team at Walter Reed, the president, his family, and the over 7 million Americans that have contracted the virus since March. I hope you'll do the same. These are strange times. When I planned out this sermon a month ago, it was all about pledging. Then last weekend, I thought, how can we not talk about tax returns? And then on Tuesday, I thought, how can we not talk about civil discourse? And here I am on Saturday night recording a whole new first half of the sermon. It used to be, I hear from people who have been doing this a long time, that once every few years there would be some week where you tossed out the planned service on Saturday night and responded to events in the world. We have had, it feels like to me, at least one of those weeks every month for the last year. Extraordinary, extraordinary times. And this is a place where we process some of those times. Each faith balances this, the some eternal truth within the context of a moment. And it's a gratifying thing to serve in a place that has the flexibility to respond to the moment, to preach with scripture in one hand and the newspaper in another, and where that flexibility is celebrated. So, This is a sermon about budgets and pledging. Nine months ago, the Board of Trustees met and put together a five-year plan for the congregation. Starting with our introduction of a second in-person service, it was a growth plan, growing membership, engagement, staffing, and yes, budgets. Four weeks after that plan was drafted, the pandemic hit, and the world that we live in is not the world of the plan that we made back in February. And so as we begin this pledge season, it's important to say that the board knows, and I know, that this is a hard year. If this church had not received funding from the payroll protection program, we would be running at a deficit this year in 2020. And so we've responded to the needs of the moment. We aren't hiring a new intern in 2021, but we are making sure that we prioritize time and resources that ensure that we are using technology well to continue to connect the congregation in this new online space. As this pandemic passes, and it will, all things do in time, 
We will re-enter our space with care and intention. And we will use this time to commit ourselves to the work of dismantling white supremacy. This is not a year where we are asking you to grow the budget. The board has done the work. They have looked at hard years in the past. They are clear-eyed about the financial difficulties of this moment. But we support the institutions where the vision lights a fire in our soul. And in 2021, the world is going to need this place. It's going to need our commitment. It's going to need our flexibility. Lincoln needs this loving community where we unite reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and our world. Each week, as part of this service, we take up a collection to support the work of this congregation in the world. And we do this because of all the reasons that I talked about in this sermon and so many others, that we each benefit from this place. We are compelled by the vision and the community we found here. And you can give this morning by texting UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. But I'm going to ask you to do one other thing this morning as the offering plays, and that's this. Think about what this place, this community, this vision means in your life. And if you pledge jointly, turn to your family and talk to them about it. And if you need to have a longer conversation, pause this video. This is one of the joys of YouTube worship. You can pause the preacher at your leisure. And then, once you've had that conversation, go pledge. And there are three ways to do this. First, you can go to our website, unitarianlincoln.org. There's a pledge form linked on the front page of the website. You can also find the form directly at unitarianlincoln.org slash 2021-pledge.html. Second, you can pledge by mail. If you're a member, you received a letter this week from the pledge team. Along with a pledge form, you can return to the church office. And last, if you are a member and you have an account set up with our church database, Realm, you can pledge directly through there. If you're a church member who does not yet have access to Realm, reach out to the office. We will get you connected to Realm. Take some time, but do this today. Because we're going to talk about how we support this church all month. But if you pledge at the beginning of the month, you'll spend the next three Sundays thinking, ah, I'm ahead of the game. Rather than thinking in October of 2020, when there are so many things on our minds, oh, that's one more thing I need to do and put on my to-do list this month. These are extraordinary times. This community can and will rise to meet them, and we need your support to continue to do so. Thank you for your generosity.
My favorite reading at this time every year is something that Jane Jepka wrote years ago to the church she was serving. It goes like this. In the 1930s, of course, times were tough. And at that time, our church members were accustomed to pledging 25 cents a week, 50 cents, or one dollar. During the 1929-1930 church year, all of the church members fulfilled their pledges of 13, 26, or 52 dollars. But as the depression continued, our ledger books began to show tiny numbers at the bottom of each page. Five cents, two dollars, twelve dollars, and then a little s. Five cents short of the pledge, twelve dollars short of a pledge. Just what one would expect. But imagine this, imagine that more numbers appear at the bottom of the ledger, $4.80, $7.30. And after these numbers, the tiny letter O, $4 over the pledge, 80 cents over. I can find no evidence of special appeal from the governing board, no traces of public discussion, only the quiet generosity of the people of our church. I read lots of historical material every week, but nothing has touched me more than the dusty ledger book from the 30s, from high up on our shelf. In our church during the depression for every pledge that had to fall short, one of many generous people overpaid his or her pledge to compensate. I love the history of this church. Gandhi was never a member. Mother Teresa never belonged either, just regular folks. They dedicated their babies, they worshiped, they reached out to do their part in the world, they cared for one another. They kept this place going. They tried to live their best lives. A long time ago, Samuel Elliott stood on our corner here at Summer Avenue and Woburn Street and dedicated this church. He said, my friends, let us not forget that the church of the spirit must be forever building. You are linking your personal religion to the spiritual life of this whole community. And in this high endeavor, I bid you Godspeed. So may it ever be. I've been thinking about that piece from Jane Jepka a lot this fall. Because times are hard right now. The economic outlook is uncertain at best and each week seems to hold a level of tension that used to be contained only by months years or decades. I can only imagine that a few generations from now, folks are going to look back at the archives of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, looking at the stories of regular folks doing their part in the world, caring for one another and trying to live their best lives. The theme for worship this month is deep listening. And in the year where we celebrate 150 years of universalism in Lincoln, more and more I'm listening to the voices of this congregation over time. The Minnells, the Chapins, and so many more folks who lived through hard times and good, who built this community and are remembered by it. We don't just give our money to the church. We do, and the congregation does need to keep the lights on. But if I started this pledge drive service talking about tax returns, I want to end it here. This is a place where we give our stories. We give our stories to the congregation. Sometimes they're remembered in letters left behind, stacks of letters from IH Hatfield trying to keep the congregation alive 130 years ago. Sometimes it's notes in a ledger. Sometimes it's the stories we tell our newest members about how our lives were changed because we knew the Hansons. The stories we hear and hold in this place are precious. And in telling them, we link our personal stories to the stories of this whole community. And in that high endeavor, we become a place of deep memory and of deep hope. because it is impossible to simply tell stories about what has been. The act of pledging either by sending in a check or participating in the community or telling the stories of those who have formed this place is also an act that ensures that this will be a community next year, 10 years from now, 150 years from now. This will be a place that tells the story of 2020, 
how the congregation and the broader community got knocked off its plan, and how the congregation responded. Now that story has yet to be told. I don't know all of the plot or how it will end. But if I had to guess, it'll sound something like this. In 2020, this congregation faced enormous uncertainty in the broader world. With our building closed to cut down on transmission of a deadly virus, the community went through some hard times. And then, and then the community responded by saying that the story of this place is still true. Universalism still has something to say. And it has a vision of the world that sees reason and spirit as complementary, that says we can create a world where justice rolls down like waters. That's a vision that is more compelling in 2020 than it has ever been before. I think that's the story that we're going to tell. May it be, and amen. We bring to this community our joys and our sorrows. We bring those seen and unseen and heard and unheard. We bring them because this is a place of calm, a place of healing. And whether you're holding someone in joy or in sorrow or anywhere in between, know that it is welcome here. These past few weeks, our family has experienced both. Sorrow at the passing of my grandmother and, and all the lives that she touched. I'd like to do a reading and dedicate it to her. When Great Trees Fall by Maya Angelou. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity, our memory, suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality, bound to them, takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced. After a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Space is filled with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses, restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be. Be and be better, for they existed. So as I hold the joy and sorrow of the life of my grandmother, think about who you might be holding in joy or in sorrow, or anywhere in between. And feel free to type their names into the chat box. Miss.
As we come to the end of our time together this morning, we extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen.